to. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Sit Down, a crime and mafia podcast. Hope you're all having a great day. We're back here, ready to go. Got a big show planned for today. Going to talk about John Gotti. I am Jeff Nadu. We're here with our regular coach, Blackjack Fletcher. Blackjack was uh, not on uh, last week's show where we talked about uh, the mafia or uh, Nikki Scarfo, but he is here uh, and he's ready to go today. Blackjack, what's happening, man? Uh, not much, buddy. Glad to be back here, ready to talk about, I mean, probably the most iconic mafia figure in history uh, in John Gotti, uh, a guy who's got a, a fascinating past, a guy who's lived ups and downs, the likes of which very few people in any walk of life has lived. So, yeah, man, I'm jacked to be back here with you. Let's, let's do this thing. Yeah, as they say, uh, and, and uh, Dominic Kinese, who played uh, Joe Ramone in the Gotti movie, made the point in the coffee shop when they're talking about John's rise, he said from a cockroach tenement to the cover of time magazine. So you know, John Gotti literally went from a housing project to one of the most, as you said, iconic mafia figures in the history of organized crime. Now, I think a lot of people, you know, if you were around in the eighties and the nineties, you knew who John Gotti was, but you might not know a ton about John Gotti. And, and that's kind of what we do on this show. We bring you the history. We'll bring you maybe some things that you didn't know or you weren't aware of and really get into the, I think, shortened boss a time that John Gotti had. He wasn't a boss for very long, um, but everything leading yeah. up was fascinating. Everything from a despair in his own family to um, to some really boneheaded decisions that he was involved in, uh, involving some family and friends uh, and people that he was uh, running around with. Uh, to his kind of rise to power and kind of taking the bull by the horns, they say, as a lot of yeah, bosses yes. did. A lot of people don't, you know, we, we talked about Giganti when he we did his show. We talked about how he always had an issue with John Gotti because of what John did to Paul Castellano. And, and that's what a lot of people know John Gotti for. But the funny thing about Giganti and all these other guys is if you look at any mob figure, so whether it was Giganti, Carlo Gambino, any of these guys, they all – killed somebody to get to the top so you know this was just another mob story and we're going to get into it today here on the show but before we do that black chick i got a cool little announcement to make Ooh. we are now sponsored by the great people at stable duel and i'm wow. excited uh, to announce that stable duel is a really great app it's an up-and-coming app we're going to tell you about it a little bit later in the show, but I know a black chick, you deal with stable duel. It's kind of that fantasy style uh, app uh, that you can get and, and you can play. Uh, you got the Kentucky Derby coming up, you get all sorts of big time events over the summer. And I know from my own personal standpoint, you're a much bigger horse guy than me, but yeah. um, I know, you know, back when quarantine was happening, uh, horse racing was pretty much all we had. So, um, you know, I'm kind of happy about that and shout out to the folks at stable duel. Yeah, I mean, listen, I love the app. I love the people there. Um, it is a great, great way for some of our listeners who maybe, you know, horse racing can be a tricky thing to get into. You know, there's a lot of different terminology. The numbers are different than in sports gambling. Stable Duel makes it really, really easy to understand. It's kind of like uh, a, a Rosetta Stone for horse racing. You know what I mean? It'll, it'll translate it for you in a way you can understand, digest, and most importantly, make money. Exactly. That's 100% right. We'll tell you a little bit more about Stable Duel uh, after we take a little bit of a, a break here in a little bit. But let's get into the life of John Gotti. We've talked about, yes. you know, the mafia cops. We've talked about Nikki Scarfo. We've talked about Vince Giganti. And it's week to week. We're talking about someone different. And this is, I think, at least for the foreseeable future, probably the final real heavy hitter. I mean, Giganti and Gotti are both real heavy hitters, but let's get into it. John Gotti, the Dapper Don, the Teflon Don uh, here on the sit down, a mafia history podcast. Uh, Black to John Joseph Gotti was born October 27, 1940 uh, in the Bronx, New York to uh, uh, Fanny and Joseph Gotti. They had 13 children, Blackjack, 13. Uh, busy now, lady. Very busy lady. And I, you know, weirdly enough, and I'm going to say this right off of the top. My dad and I talk about this occasionally, and I'm going to relate it to my own life. You know, uh, Blackjack, my father and John Gotti have a lot of similarities. And I'm going to tell you what they are. So my dad's one of 15. So 
they have a big family. That was Lord. Yeah. Yeah. My father resented his own father, which John did, which we're going to get into. And I've always looked at, you know, my dad ended up becoming, you know, he's not the boss of a mafia family. Um, but my dad had every reason in the world to be a failure in life, to be a criminal. Uh, and he found a way to, to not be one. Um, and I always find it interesting because they are very similar. They had, you know, John Gotti had a, a cement mixer incident. My dad had a cement mixer incident, uh, weirdly Ooh. enough. So are we going to talk about that more? Yes, I'll definitely bring that up yes. for sure. Um, so John was, was one of five brothers who would eventually get into the life. Uh, John obviously had the uh, highest reign uh, in uh, the mob, but his brother Gene was a big time mob guy. Peter Gotti, who actually just recently passed away. Uh, he was involved with the mafia and actually became the boss when uh, John went away. His other brothers, Richard and Vincent, were both uh, associates and soldiers as well. The Gottis grew up in poverty. Any family in the 40s that had 13 children, whether you had f- even if you had five children, uh, it's not easy. OK, I mean, it's not easy to support um, that many kids, especially 13. Um, and his dad didn't have steady work. And that was really the problem for John Gotti. And that was one of the issues and where he really began to kind of, I think, resent his father because his dad didn't have steady work. He didn't really act like a father. Uh, he was a big time gambler, a big degenerate. And he wasn't a real kind of role model. Um, and, you know, any kid growing up in the 40s had you know, not only all that war stuff to think about, but, you know, J- John had no father figure. Um, he had a history of bullying and, and truancy. He didn't really go to school. Uh, the family actually moved to East New York, which is a, a part of Brooklyn. And that's kind of where John kind of came up. Uh, he started getting involved with some local street gangs at like 12. I uh, started associating with a group called the Fulton Rockaway Boys. And that's where he met Angela Ruggiero, who uh, became you know, one of his best friends throughout his entire life. The cement mixer incident comes when he's 14. They start kind of petty crime. They start stealing things, uh, B&Es, that sort of thing. They go to a construction site and steal a cement mixer. Now, when I mean cement mixer, I'm not talking about a truck. I'm talking about, right. I'm, you're probably aware, there's the, the small mixers that you hook to the back of a truck, basically, yep. and you can wheel it around and whatever. Those are heavy. Uh, and if it falls on you, you're going to have some trouble. Oh, yeah. uh, so the cement mixer falls on John's foot, uh, crushing his toes and late into his life. If you've ever seen John Gotti walk, like when he's walking, like out of the courthouse or wherever, if you notice uh black chick, he always had like, he walked on like the top of his feet. If you've noticed, yeah, I had like that strut. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's what most people probably attribute it to. Right. Because yeah. honestly, before I knew about the, the cement mixer thing, I just thought he was kind of walking like Vince McMahon, you know, just kind of had like a yeah, saunter it was to him. a permanent limp he had. Yeah. Weirdly enough. So yeah, that, that's kind of where that came from. Um, you know, he, be, you know, was doing all sorts of stuff, kind of just trying to get his, his start. He didn't really have much, you know, that in that time in New York, you know, Street gangs were, were pervade pretty much everywhere. So uh, they were around. And that's obviously where he met Ruggiero and uh, Willie Boyd Johnson, who was uh, a friend of him as well. Um, real quick, to relate it to my dad, who I talk about, my dad, Blackjack, uh, dropped out of school when he was 14. Didn't go to high school or anything. Uh, he started working for a mason. He became a mason. And when he first started out, he was a laborer. All he did was uh, carry brick and mix cement and things like that. Um, one day he was working with a cement mixer and he got his hand caught in the mixer and it ripped his pinky and ring finger off. And my dad told me to this day, he was so scared that he would get fired that he just wrapped like a piece of towel around him and just kept working. Yeah. And so does he have three fingers or did they put him back on? Well, I would tell you. So he's he he was so scared that he just acted like nothing was going on. He was in horrible pain. Oh my god! And there was blood like gushing out of the 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 Sweet towel. Sweet baby Jesus! Yeah, and the 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 foreman who actually was like a, a mentor to my dad when he was a kid, he goes, "What in the fuck is wrong? What? Why are you bleeding so much?" And he goes, "Holy fuck!" He goes, "You don't have fucking fingers." And he pulls the towel off and he goes. <laughs> Why didn't you say anything? He goes, well, I don't want to get fired. And they took him to the hospital. My dad actually 
he got it sewed back on. But to this day, my dad has no fingernails on his ring finger and his uh, pinky finger. So that's fucking wild. Yeah. He was so worried about getting fired that he didn't say anything, but it was so noticeable that he had to say something. But yeah, it's weird because they have a lot of similarities growing up. Um, In 1958, John was 18. He was still moving around doing crime. Uh, He actually met his wife, though, uh, in a bar, Victoria de Giorgio. Uh, (laughs) He met her. They had their first child in 1961 and got married in 62. So by 22, John Gotti was married, had a child uh, at 21. So he was getting starting started quick, ended up having five children. And in his early 20s, John actually went for kind of a normal life. He tried to work uh, regular jobs and it didn't really work out. I mean, imagine John Gotti working a regular job. (laughs) Yeah, I can't. I have a hard time imagining John Gotti working well for anyone. Yeah, right. Like, exactly. I don't think he's a guy that takes takes orders from a boss real no. well. I mean, as as demonstrated later. No, exactly. And by 1966, he had already been jailed a few times. Couldn't stay crime free, um, but he had a lot of connections in the streets. Uh, obviously, a lot of street gangs work as kind of farm teams to the mob. Now, the Fort Rockaway boys were just a bunch of teenagers, but um, as you come up, you meet people. Uh, He became kind of associating uh, with uh, a guy, Carmine Fatico, who is a a capo regime in the the Anastasia Gambito crime family. Kind of started doing some things, truck hijackings, things like that. John actually had a big start at Ottawa Airport, which would become Kennedy Airport. And he'd actually bump uh, kind of elbows with a lot of guys, you know, whether it was Jimmy Burke or Joe Messino. Uh, who would end up being the Bonanno family boss years later. Um, And that's around the time where I think John really became molded into a street guy. That's when he met Neil Delacroach. And for someone in John that didn't have much of a mentor or a father figure growing up, I think he really latched on to Neil Mm -hmm. from that standpoint. You know, Neil was a street guy. He was a stone cold killer he was a gambler. Uh, they had a yeah. lot of interests and you know, Neil kind of took him under his wing and I think ultimately, you know, shaped John Gotti into who he became. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think if you, if you look into to Neil Delacroach and John Gotti, and I can't wait till we do an episode on Neil Delacroach, but I think John Gotti probably looked at Neil Delacroach and saw everything he wanted to be. Yeah. Right. Like when you say a father figure, that's exactly what it is. Like he looked at this guy and said, this is the man I want to become. Right. Like he has a similar background. He's taken a similar path and now he's risen up. He's successful. And this is the guy that I want to be. This is a guy whose path I can follow. Yeah. And for anyone that is aware of who Neil was, I mean, Neil Delacroach was a stone cold gangster his entire life, uh, had one of the the scariest stares in mob history. I mean, he was a Cosa Nostra to the core, and he was a great person to learn off of. Uh, in uh, late 1968, John's doing a lot of truck hijacking. He starts stealing loads of anything, anything they get their hands on, cigarettes, clothing, you know, anything. Um, John's arrested. Uh, in late 1968, him and Ruggiero, they get three years at Lewisburg. Uh, they go away. Uh, and in that late time, John, by that point, has a few kids. And yeah. John's son tells a story about when they were kids, his mother would take them to Lewisburg because Lewisburg's in Pennsylvania. It's not far mm-hmm. from New York. It's a drivable distance in one day. For sure. They would talk about the, the kids would talk about when they would go to see him as children, his mother would tell them that they were going to see him at work. He was building uh, the prison, basically. That was his job. And it worked, um, you know, but he, Gotti Jr. would talk later in life about it. he would always get teased that like his father, he didn't have a father and, yeah. you know, and, and they were ostracized for that. But, you know, John was trying to create a niche for him mm-hmm. and for his family and to make money. And, he got kind of jammed up in 1972, him and Ruggieri are paroled and they head back to the Bergen hunt and fish club and, and continue to work under our Carmine Fatico. Uh, by that point, you know, John's doing a lot of different things. Um, he couldn't associate though with known felons and your know, Carmine Fatico ends up uh, uh, getting jammed up for some uh, loan shark loan sharking charges. 
Uh, and um, Gotti's named acting capo of the Bergen crew. So, you know, the Bergen crew was his. He had kind of taken it from Charlie Wags Fatico, and, yep. and it was his thing now. Um, and he would also start reporting directly to Neil De La Croce, who would work out of the Ravenite in Manhattan. Uh, and that's kind of where that started. Um, and look, again, they were two peas in a pot because they were the same person. As you said, John looked at Neil as him in 30 years, basically. Yeah, exactly. That's what he was. Yeah, exactly. And and the thing, Jeff, that I think, too, is ironic here is like when you look at John Gotti's criminal history, especially early on, he kind of got his name through all of these hijackings. Right. I mean, Northwest Airline, you know, then afterwards, obviously, he's involved in, in much, much bigger hijackings. Can you even imagine doing that today, like strolling up to the gates of an airport in a truck and just hijacking shit off an airliner? Like it's it's unfathomable. Number one, the balls it takes. And number two, just the difference in security between now and then. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind during that time when he got jammed up for the for the hijackings, I mean, he was jumping on loads of like cigarettes. There was an instant where yeah. he I mean, 50 grand in 1968, that's equivalent today to like. 400 grand yeah right it's so close it's to like, 10 times that's a ton of product and it's like yeah it, it's you kind of think about today like how far we are from that point and i've always said like and, and i mean this if i grew up in the 30s or 40s i'd have surely been a criminal because, oh dude crime would be so easy yeah because like there were no there's no cameras there were no like you would have to literally to be charged with murder you would have to either be seen by someone doing it or they would have had direct ev- evidence that you did it. There was no it, DNA. There was no like. I think back forensic. to even like, like in my mind, like the seventies was kind of the golden age oh, of, yeah. of somewhat organized crime. Like I'm not talking, you know, like bullshit crime, but like yeah. in the seventies, you had enough modernization to be able to get around and do things and have knowledge. Like, you know, you, fingerprints existed, but you knew, Hey, I wear gloves. But there wasn't DNA evidence, right? There wasn't surveillance everywhere. We didn't have everyone with a cell phone. In if their you would pocket. just think a little bit, yeah. If you just it. used a little bit of thought in like the 1960s and 70s, you could commit almost any crime you wanted. I mean, think about like serial killers, right? Like mm-hmm. so many of them happened during that time period because it was just so damn hard to get caught. You don't see it to that extent today. I mean, D.B. Cooper, if he did that today, he'd be caught before he Woo! hit the ground. You know? D.B. Cooper, fascinating guy. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's really interesting. And and look, that's why the golden age of the mob was from the 30s until the 80s, because, yeah, you, you know, and, and you look at dr- drug trafficking, you look at all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just not able to happen today. Um In 1973, John's 33. He's a fledging member of. Of, of organized crime. He's coming up. People are starting to, to know who he is. His name's starting to ring out. In 73, a wild situation develops in the Gambino crime family. So the boss at the time is Carla Gambino. Um, there was a kidnapping ring going around. A group of Irish mobsters were basically going around and kidnapping family members of mobsters and basically saying, look, give us you know, ransom basically, and we'll release your family member to you. It was, when you think of it, it was obviously a very dangerous thing to do, but it was also smart as well, because you're not going to go to the police. You're just going to pay what you got to pay. And and that's that. Um, But they fuck with the wrong guy. Basically it's pretty brazen to kidnap Carla Gambino's nephew. Yeah. Brazen's one word. Stupid's another. Yeah. Now again, the kicker in all this was they were kidnapping people, but they're always letting them go. This time, though, Manny Gambino, Gambino's nephew, is kidnapped. They give him the ransom, and he's murdered on top of it. That was the end of this kidnapping ring. Basically, Gambino assembles a hit squad to basically find the Irish fucks that did this. And the ringleader... <laughs> was this guy, James McBratney, this Irish yep. guy from Staten Island. This is such a great story. Yeah, so Gambino basically asked for Gotti to come to uh, you know, his place of business, and he orders that they find McBratney and 
take care of business. So he orders Gotti, Ruggiero, and a guy, Ralph Gallon, to do the hit. Now, Gallon was uh, a gangster in Castellano's crew. Now, if you watch the film about John yeah. Gotti, the HBO yeah. version, that was a pretty good portrayal of who Ralph Gallon uh, was. Yeah, he was a drug addict. Yeah, Gallon was a real shitbag. I mean, he was a hitman, but he was a real shitbag. Um, you know, his actually, his son, uh, uh, Froggy Gallon, uh, James Gallon, he actually is... Uh, I believe still involved in life today, but he, um, he was a scumbag guy. Uh, so guy goes on the hit. The plan was to walk into this bar where they knew McBratney would be. They were going to kind of impersonate, um, you know, detectives. They were going to try to take him out uh, into the parking lot and, uh, you know, take care of him out in the parking lot. But guy mm-hmm. gets jumpy, basically. Yep. McBratney kind of lunges at Gotti and Ruggiero this idiot guy shoots him in the middle of the bar and they're basically identified by a, a ton of, of witnesses. Yeah. A barmaid and customer basically uh, at the bar in Staten Island, basically recognize them and they were, they were apprehended. Now this is where Gotti becomes, it becomes fascinating. So Gambino yeah. hires Roy Cohen to defend Gotti. Now for anyone that doesn't know, Roy Cohen's like, he makes Michael Cohen look like fucking, uh, you know, some public defender. I mean, Roy Cohen is one of the most well-known, I, I would say one of the, the greatest attorneys that, that there's been in a long time. He worked with Joseph McCarthy. He actually also defended Donald Trump yep. uh, for a long time. Um, he was the prosecutor of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg during their trial uh, for espionage. Um, he was also gay and died of AIDS. Yes. Uh, so uh, a, a just a fascinating, fascinating guy. And yeah, he defended John Gotti in this trial. And was also a lawyer for Fat Tony Salerno, Carlo uh-huh. Gambino, basically every mob guy. If you were a high-level individual and you had the money and you wanted to get off That's it. of any case, you hired Roy Cohn. That's it. If, if you were in New York specifically and you had money, Roy Cohn was the call. Right. So on October 17th of 73, Gotti's uh, charged with murder. Um, now, keep in mind, Gotti at this point is furious of from Guyon. He wants Guyon dead. Um, you know, Ruggiero basically says he can't kill him. He's a made guy. You can't kill him. And Gotti just says, fuck it, and orders Guyon killed. And Gas- Castellano becomes furious as well. But by that point, he's identified. Gotti's arrested. Roy Cohen somehow. Now keep in mind, they killed a guy on a barroom floor with witnesses. Cohen strikes a bar plea bargain and he gets four years. Four years for attempted manslaughter. Yeah. I don't know what the attempt is, considering he was dead. Yeah, I don't but either. I think it's important to note the the significance of this incident because the fact that Gotti not only took this personal errand for Carlo Gambino, but then took the rap for it and also killed Guyon, which even though it's a no, no, I don't think it upset Carlo Gambino all that much because Ralph Guyon was a shit show. And then Gotti winds up taking the rap for this and going to prison. I think it's important to note the amount of favor that that probably curried him with Carlo Gambino. Yeah. I think Gambino was always kind of, um, indebted to Gotti for that and I think deep down everybody knew Guyon was a scumbag and had to go and you know he shouldn't have did that now Gotti shouldn't have killed a made man but that okay which was definitely a blatant uh mistake and and rule rule break but it was also identified later and again I I've always been skeptical to believe this but there was something going around that John Gotti gets a suspended sentence um, he's out on the street in 1975. And I think in almost kind of a ode to Paul Castellano as kind of a favor after the guy own mishap. So there's a guy, Vito Borelli. Uh, he was a, a, a kind of a low level shit bag. He was the boyfriend of Castellano's daughter. And I guess there was conversation picked up that Borelli said, Castellano looked like Frank Purdue, which was the <laughs> Purdue chicken owner. <laughs> and if you know what that guy looks like, he's kind of like yeah. a goofy, yeah. like 
elderly yeah. guy. Like, yeah, and Castellano. I could see a, the resemblance. Not really, but Come on, a little bit. Uh, but so Castellano took offense to that and basically says, I don't want this fuck around my daughter. And this has always been a point of contention with John Gotti, because when you look back at John's life, he didn't pull the trigger in the guy own murder. Right. Right. And there was always a question of, did John Gotti ever actually kill, kill somebody? People. Yeah. Right. Did he ever pull the trigger? Now, keep in mind, Joseph Messino, who was the person that brought this thought up, Joseph Messino was an informant. He was the first mob boss in the history of organized crime to ever testify against his own family. So take what John, Joe Messino says. I kind of believe it. Um, Gotti ended up going to jail for this and, and kind of broke his uh, suspended sentence agreement, but he was never ultimately brought on it. But there was thought that John Gotti did take care of this. So this could be the piece of work that maybe kind of put him over the top. But whether we believe that, do you, do you believe that at all? There's two things here, right? Number one, I think it's important to note that at the time all this stuff happens, I don't believe John Gotti was yet a made man in the Gambino crime no, family, right? Not. Like, so he's still not there. What I'm saying he, is, did this kind he, of make his bones? I don't know, Jeff. And the only thing that, that makes me hesitate is I think we all know the way John Gotti felt about Paul Castellano. So I don't, I don't know that he's going out on a limb to do favors for him unless it comes from either Carlo Gambino or Neil Delacroix. Well, now, I maybe, think he, maybe he it, felt you know, the if, need to. Because if, if if Mr. Neal comes to him and says, hey, listen, this would be a good favor for you to do for Paul, then, yeah, I think he does it without hesitation. I just don't know that he's going out on his own and doing it. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, maybe it curried favor. You know, maybe he ultimately knew he was wrong and he was wrong to kill guy own you know, unsanctioned was not the way to do things. Maybe he felt the need to do that for, for Castellano. But in 1976, John's away in jail. Uh, on the, the the McBratney hit, he has to serve some time. Uh, Gambino dies. Carlo Gambino dies in 1976. Uh, and Paul Castellano is named boss. And this is where things kind of go sideways. Because John believed, and I think a lot of people in the family believe, that Mr. Neal, uh, this was his opportunity to become the boss. He had been the underboss. He had kind of made his yep. due, paid his dues. And... Paul is made boss because keep in mind, Paul was a family member of Important Carlo to note. Yes. Right. Um, and I think I don't ever, I don't ever really think that this is the answer, but I think Carlo basically maybe assumed that the family needed to go in kind of a different way as far as more business minded, not so flashy murder, you know, mayhem, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Neil and Paul were two totally different bosses, I think. And, you know, John is released in 77 and is completely enraged by this. He, he again, yeah. looked at Neil as a father figure and he thought it was a bit of a slight. But in 77, John is officially initiated into the Gambino crime family. He's now a made man and he's the capo regime of the Bergen crew and reports directly to Neil Delacroix. So he finally got his big wish. Yeah, I mean, he's a made man at this point. He's reporting to Neil. But I think you 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 talked about this, and it's it's important to note about the, the where this family was at the time, right? Because, and I think you're right, they, that Carlo Gambino wanted this family to go in a more, I don't want to say legitimate direction, but I think he wanted them to focus more on business as opposed to, you know, the bookmaking and loan sharking and the general, you know, roughhousing that they had been in, which probably, if we're being honest, was the right direction to go in. The problem is, you know, Castellano, I think to a lot of people in that family, it looked like he kind of he kind of jumped some places in line because Neil Delacroach was the epitome of a gangster and was the underboss and got skipped over for this guy. And it, it feels like now you've got two separate factions in the same family. You've got a house divided. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the start of, of where things start to get really interesting. What we're going to do, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back to you right after this here on A Sit Down. And welcome back to The Sit Down, a crime and mafia podcast. We're back here talking about John Gotti. Big show today. 
really interesting show as well. But before we get into the rest of the show, I want to tell you about a new sponsor, Stable Duel. Make sure if you were a listener of this show and you enjoy this show, we can't do it f- totally for free. We do do it for free, but you know we need to we need to try to make some ends some way, right? So go check out Stable Duel. And if you're a sports better, you enjoy gambling, you like to have some fun, maybe you like to gamble on the ponies. There's a new way to gamble on horse racing, and it's called Stable Duel. It's an app. You can get it on the App Store, Android, Apple, wherever you get your apps. It's a basically horse racing style game for fantasy, for fantasy, basically. It's a fantasy football version. Uh, you basically select a stable of 10 horses and compete against others at various tracks around the country. So whether it's Santa Anita or Gulfstream or Keeneland, um, you pick your horses and you basically accumulate points for finishing one to five with a variance due to lengths either won by or beaten by. Uh, there's a reward system that gives you perks the more you play. And it's cheap. You can get involved in daily contests for a very small entrance entry amounts, and you can win big cash prizes, uh, high dollar games, free games, cheap games, whatever you want. It's easy stuff. It's easy to get involved. It's easy to start playing today. I played Stable Duel. It's fun. It le- lets you, if you're going to bet kind of on a, on a betting basis, that's fine, but it gives you another kind of skin in the game. Uh, to get involved. And if you can kind of hit the right combination of horses, you can win some big time money. So I urge you go right now, go to your app store. If you enjoy horse racing, maybe you're just getting into it, whatever your kind of player you are, go get a stable duel, get involved today. Maybe you'll see blackjack and I in the stables and you don't have to beat us. I don't know, Uh, but go check out stable duel right now. All right. uh, Back to John Gotti. So Gotti comes out of jail. He's on top of the world. He's a capo in the Bergen crew. He's in the Gambino crime family. He's reporting to Della Croce. And obviously, as you said, it set up a bit of a crack because there was a faction, and I think it was a large faction of the Gambino family that didn't necessarily want Paul as the boss. Um, Paul is kind of a buttoned up businessman. Uh, he's not real in you know into the streets, doesn't really move much in that. Uh, mm-hmm. But Gotti's doing some big things. He's got a big time loan shark sharking uh, operation he's moving gambling stuff around he's got a notion of job at a plumbing company um he's got all sorts of 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 money uh, streams coming in even drug dealing from what uh the which FBI is a alleged. big no-no under paul castellano right which is really ridiculous which is so f- odd because you know when you look back at bosses like castellano or angelo bruno kind of these bosses that are so behind they they have these thoughts of we're not going to take drug money but we, I might take drug money and just kind of pretend I'm not taking drug money, but you can't sell drugs. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess on one, in one hand, I understand the logic was because prior to the RICO statutes coming in, federal drug laws sure. were the strictest laws there were, right? They yeah. carried massive mandatory sentences. The problem is at this time, RICO is a law, right? Like it's a law. And so- yeah, you can say we don't want to take drug money because of the sentences, but like they're going to get you on racketeering no matter what you're doing. So uh, there's really no difference. So the problem that Paul had was he was taking money from Roy DeMeo, who was a big time drug dealer. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that was kind of the, the hypocrisy of of Paul. You know, he was, you know, on one hand saying you can't sell drugs, but I'm going to take drug money. And, uh, you know as long as I do it, it's okay. You know, it's kind of hypocritical. Uh, in 1980, John Gotti is 40 years old. Okay. As I said, kind of on top of the world, he's got money coming in. He moves his family out to Howard beach, Queens, nice uh, tree lined uh, block, you know, got a lawn. And to this day, uh, the house is still lived in by his, uh, his wife, Victoria, who's still alive. Uh, the same house in 1980, John's youngest son, Frank Gotti, 12 years old. He's coming home from uh, football practice, has a, a little mini bike he's riding, and he darts out into the Bell Parkway and, or, or uh, I think Ozone Boulevard or whatever the boulevard. Yeah, it was there. the street over by their house. Yeah. And he's hit by a car and killed. And it was ruled an accident. It's just one of those terrible mm-hmm. things yeah. where a neighbor, hits him, you know, doesn't see him, hits him, kills him. And I think initially 
everyone assumed it was it was it was an accident. The sure. problem was Victoria Gotti obviously took it very hard. That was her youngest son. Italian families are very close knit, as we know. I mean, every family's close knit, but for Italians, family is it's almost like if you hurt one of ours, we're gonna hurt one of yours in a way. And there was there was things going around that Favaro was talking negatively about it. And there was a situation where Victoria almost attacks Favaro with a baseball bat after some things went on. And John decides, okay, you know, I'm going to kind of get out of here for a couple of days. I'm going to take my wife and whatever you guys decide to do, we know you'll do it because yeah. you respect me. Yeah. And on July 28th, 1980, a few months after Frank Gotti is killed, John Favara is abducted and was never seen again. And his body to this day has never been recovered. Uh, you would assume, and obviously we assume, that he was murdered. Now, John Gotti was never charged. No one was ever charged for the murder no. of John Favara. No. And one thing I will say, Gotti Jr. did a interview on 60 Minutes 10 years ago or so. And they actually asked him about that. And Gotti Jr. basically said, they asked him, you know, do, do you think he had anything to do with it? And John basically said, you know, probably, you know, you're not going to kill one of his and he's not going to kill one of yours. So, yeah, it was assumed that Gotti either ordered the hit and uh, had an alibi, basically. Yeah, I mean, listen, John Gotti was in Florida at the time. And for those who may not know this about him, he, uh, John Gotti abhorred flying. He didn't fly anywhere. So he drove the family down to Florida yeah. from New York. Um, so he had pretty much an airtight alibi as to it. Um, you know, one of the, the interesting things to me about the Favara, I guess you have to call it a, a disappearance because there was no body found and, and the feds have different theories on this, but nothing ever, ever really panned out. Um, you know, it, the interesting thing to me about this Favara thing is that, you know, Sammy Gravano talked about a lot of things, right? I mean, a lot of things. Yeah, he never brought that up. He never talked about that one. And you know damn well that, like, if Sammy Gravano was involved, which at that point, how could he not be? Him and Gotti were fairly close at that point. I don't know why he wouldn't have said it. So it, it, there's, it's an odd situation, right? Because, like, on all levels, this feels like something that was done for John Gotti. But, you know, at the same time, why don't we know about it? Yeah, I think from what I've read and what I've come to understand, John Gotti had a guy, Charlie Carneglia, who was a hitman for him, basically. He came up kind of behind Gotti. From what federal people allege, Carneglia took care of John Favar and basically disposed of his body in acid. And Gravano was not involved. Um, so I, I don't think Gravano was directly involved. Now, the movie says that he was. He wasn't. He wasn't involved, I don't think. Uh, and I think he would have dispelled of the Favara hit, obviously, in testimony. Yeah, right? he would have talked about it. He talked about everything else. But yeah, I don't think I don't think Gravano did the job. I think Carnegie did the job. He was probably told to do huh. it through an emissary, and Gotti was gone, so there was no See, way. See, Jeff, that's why I love doing this podcast with you. I learn something every time. There you go. Uh, in his final couple years as Capo, Gotti is indicted on two situations. One situation was in '84. Uh, John Gotti gets in some kind of weird altercation <laughs> with a <laughs> this citizen. Is a good one. Yeah. Um, a guy called Romo Pychik. Truck uh, driver. Yeah, basically this mechanic, truck driver. Uh, they get into a fist fight and robbery. The guy says he robs him and beats him up. Um, and then in 85, he's also indicted alongside Neil De La Croce and other Bergen kids, guys yeah. for uh, racketeering. Yep. Um, now, in that case, there were some issues with the attorney, Diane Jacqueline. She had some personal mm, things that yeah. she was involved in. That, that yeah, she weren't, did. weren't real good, but there were two things that came out of both cases. In the racketeering case, Gotti beats the rap on that. Um, yep. But something comes out that's very, very tough for Gotti. His one of his friends from childhood, 
Willie Boy Johnson uh, had been proven as an informant for nearly 20 years. Um, so that was kind of a damning for Gotti. And then in the Pychik case, Pychik this, this kind of comes up with this deluded tale that he finds out who John Gotti is and all of a sudden recants everything on the stand. And he gets amnesia, basically. And I remember this to this day. Yep. Um, I actually recovered the newspaper pretty incredibly. I, I know. I know. I did. I looked at the, <laughs> the article, too. But yeah, there's um on I think it was the Daily News. The Daily News, yep. Uh basically the front page says I forgot he. <laughs> and I've always said the Daily News because of a great fucking titles. Dude, um, it's it's the best thing because the these are the two cases that give him the name the Teflon Don, right? Sure. Because yeah, be- this guy, the the ADA, and I'm I'm reading out of the Daily News article here, says that the witness was afraid to testify. And Pychik said, he said, I saw the name of the man who assaulted me appearing in the Daily News and the media printed that he was next in line for the Godfather. Naturally, my idea for pursuing the matter dropped. Yes, he was, he was done. Um, he didn't want any of, and, and look, you can't blame him. I mean, no, no. you know, I, I think, uh, I think you're all about like you get into like a road rage incident or whatever. It's like, okay, you know, if I'm a normal, whatever, I'm just going to go and talk about it. But then you find out it's John Gotti. It's like, well, wait a second. Uh, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, in the other case, Jack alone had issues because she was getting involved with jurors and things like that. It, it, it just became kind of bad. So John Gotti beats the rap on both those cases. Um, By this point, in 85 the entire family becomes pretty sick of paul castellano obviously um the drug uh things with you can't sell drugs but i'll take drug money from other people castellano buys a house on staten island he becomes isolated and greedy according to them and becomes kind of to it as the white house right on toad hill yeah it's still there today um, and a lot of people were just kind of sick of his like businessman kind of stature. During this time, Ruggiero and Gotti's brother Gene are arrested for dealing heroin. And a lot of it had to do with Ruggiero's constant talking about it. He was picked up on a bug in his house. And this was a big problem for Gotti because he pissed Castellano off again. And it was really kind of a race to the clock. I think the kind of get this handled and figured out. The problem was there were two problems. Castellano was involved in his own criminal stuff. He was arrested for a Rico case mm-hmm. and Neil De La Croce never would have signed off on Castellano being whacked. No. In no way. Because Old say school. what you want about Castellano and say what you want about De La Croce. They're both stone cold gangsters and they respected the Cosa Nostra rules. So yeah. John almost had to wait until Della Croce, who developed his own health problems, uh, he dies. And they come up with this idea. By this point, Gotti's involved with Sammy Ravano, Frank DeChico, um, you know, all these different uh, guys. And they come up with this idea to basically, we're going to whack Castellano. <laughs> so in this, on December 2nd of 85, Della Croce dies of cancer. Tommy Bellotti is elevated to boss and, or, or Castellano is still the boss. Tommy Bellotti is under boss. Yeah. And I guess the succession plan was if Castellano goes away, Bellotti's the new boss. In 1985, this is when it all gets created. Castellano is going to go to Spark Steakhouse to have a meeting with uh, other Gambino family associates. It was during Christmas time. They figure out he's going to be there. At that point, Gravano and Gotti park across the street, and they have six gunmen who are basically standing near the entrance of Spark Steakhouse. And as Castellano pulls up, they get out of the car. They begin to fill fill his ass up with some hot ones. They hit him and Bellotti. Now, keep in mind, okay, Spark Steakhouse is – in the middle 
of New York City. Okay, yep. it's on fifty fifth, I think, and third. Yeah, yeah, or forty six and third. Sorry. Okay. Um, you know, literally right in the middle of Midtown. Basically, dinner hour in the yeah. middle of Christmas time. Yeah, on the yeah, it like the Diamond Dish is right near there. Rockefeller Center is right near mm-hmm. there. Like this is like the Chrysler Building's right down the street. Like this is Grand Central's right down the street. Like this is yeah. big time New York City. The brazenness to just and like where are the cops? By the way, well, I, you know, Jeff, I, it's I think part of the reason why. John Gotti has the the place in lore that he has today is because of this hit, right? Because, yeah. and in some ways I'll give him credit. It's brilliant, right? Like if you're this willing to kill someone in the middle of New York city at the busiest time of the year in midtown Manhattan, anybody who dared testify against you has to think, well, what the fuck are they going to do to me? Like, I mean, it's so brazen and so public that you're almost daring people go ahead talk who wants to be that person nobody no exactly and like i'm not saying it was a good thing to do like obviously killing is always wrong we know that but you know paul castellano should have known something was wrong with him the minute you said he was from staten island you and i both know people from staten island stink (laughs) yeah they do for sure uh so they kill him right in the middle of 46th street and at that point in the coming days Gotti's basically the boss okay everybody knew what was going on and on january 15th 1986 Gotti's appointed new boss of the gambino family um and he appoints frank de chico his underboss he also had gravano involved uh, joe gallo was involved a lot of people involved Gotti rises to power okay he starts acting a lot different too He's wearing $10,000 suits. He's galvanizing around New York, um, going to clubs, doing his whole thing. Gets featured on Time Magazine, Forbes Magazine, like all these different publications. Um, and he was making a ton of money. All right. You know, and, and yes. he was really the first boss of this kind since Al Capone. If you know anything about Al Capone, Capone was very out there as well. Okay. Yeah. Everybody knew who he was. He was kind of that public enemy number one right and i think what this did and we've talked about this in other shows the other families began to really resent Gotti because for as dangerous as a guy like anthony casso was for as crazy and weird as vincent giganti was for you know all these guys you know uh, tony corralla all these guys they were all low-key and they all dealt with business and did business they didn't put it out there in front of everybody. They made it, John Gotti made it a thing for someone in Omaha, Nebraska to knew who he was, right? They yep. didn't know who the fuck Vincent Giganti was. They didn't know who the fuck Tony Corallo was. Yeah, and John and Gotti really kind of created that lore of. It, it's a, the comparison to Compone is a great one by you because they both not only had that title of like public enemy number one, but they embraced it. I think they loved it. Like they thrived on having that attached to them. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because Anthony Casso, who we talked, we've talked about before on shows who is kind of in, you know, uh, well, he was, he was a big timer in the Lucchese family. He once stated that Gotti did basically destroyed Cosa Nostra for what it was. He basically exposed everything and everyone within Cosa Nostra. He gave it's all true. of the business out like it was a movie. A mob yeah. boss isn't supposed to be that high profile. I mean, he's supposed to be known, but not filmed in the news every day getting pictures taken. Yep. And John would always contend that they put their cameras on my face, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but again, keep in mind, I mean, they're making a ton of money. Uh, at one point, it was estimated that on annual income, they were bringing in like a hundred billion dollars. Like they were oh, making a ton dude. of money, dude. I mean, listen, and that's the one thing that like, you know, listen, you can always, it's easy to look back after the guy gets caught and say, Oh, you know, well, we, we didn't think it was the right thing, but no one had a problem getting fat when he was around because everyone was getting fat. Exactly. And you know, it's interesting because John Gotti would 
throughout his time as boss, um, he would develop these rules that he would have. And you know, he did run his family a certain way. Uh, it, it was kind of a mix of we're going to make a ton of money, but we're also going to blow somebody's head off if they need to. Um, but they made money and things ran from 86 to like 90 really well. Um, now, there were some interesting quirks that Gotti had, uh, one of which was no family member could accept a plea bargain because basically that would acknowledge the existence of the organization, Yep, which is kind of wild because I feel like he did that on his own. Well, he, he did, but at the time it's worth noting he was not part of the family. But it's interesting too, because, you know, I've seen video and wiretaps and heard things of John Gotti. And I think anyone that knew John, like in that realm of just like hanging out, they'll tell you that John Gotti was actually a really nice guy. Like at yes. least in, in, in passing, yes. like there's a lot of video of him. Like it would be reported that he would offer a coffee to like FBI following him. He oh, hundred percent. I mean, yeah, that's a well-known thing. He was exceptionally polite to the feds that followed him. And I also think that part of the reason, you know, again, why people, you know, I, I mean, I know, Jeff, you're from Pennsylvania, but you follow this so closely. Yeah. I grew up in New York. Like people in New York literally romanticize John Gotti. And, and part of the reason is if you weren't involved with organized crime, he was a very generous man. He would throw these massive parties in Howard Beach for everyone. Yeah. Like he was a he was a benevolent guy unless you had crossed him. Yeah. And I think with John, like he he was a. Uh... Larger than life. Like you would see him like he was good looking. He dressed well. He was powerful. Yes. Like, like there's a video on YouTube. I, I watch it occasionally. It was like this, I guess it was like a, a FBI like video or something. And like somebody recovered it. And it was like, it basically just sat on the Ravenite and you yep. watch people come and go. And there's this one, a Gotti where like, he just walks across the street and you look at him. He's just like this regal guy. Like, and it's like seeing him, it's, it's almost like, he's like an icon almost, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was a guy that I think to most people, he's a pretty nice guy, but he, as you yes. said, if you cross him, you know, he, he's going to blow your head off in 1986. Um, some bad things happened in the family though. Yeah. Underboss Frank DeChico is killed uh, in a car bomb um, basically to send a message. Um, but it was also to, to kind of say, look, we're fucking pissed off that you killed Castellano uh, and Vic Amuso and Anthony Casso basically uh, on orders from Corallo and Giganti do this to avenge the Castellano hit. Um, and it was kind of meant for Gotti. I, th I think the goal was Gotti would be involved in it as well, but he ended up canceling the meeting that he was going to go to and didn't end up doing it. Um, now, uh, during this time, Gotti and Gravano are really piling up bodies. Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, D, Robert D. Bernardo's killed, who uh, did a lot of stuff in like the porno business. Uh, all sorts of guys are starting to be whacked out by Sam Gravano. Uh, Gravano is kind of the Lord High Executioner for the family. Yep. As we know, Gravano killed, what, 20 guys. Um, but John's, again, um, implicated in another racketeering case in uh, it, during this time. And he's actually doing all this stuff from jail. Um, and he, in 1986, stands trial along with his brother, Gene, and a couple other guys, Nicky Carrazzo, John Corneglia, Leonard Di Maria, Anthony Rampino. They all go on, uh, on trial for, for another mm -hmm. racketeering case. Uh, it, at that point, basically, he had hired this guy, Bruce Cutler. Uh, Great lawyer. Yeah. Another bulldog kind of lawyer. And this Jack alone is involved again. <laughs> Diane Jack alone is a character. Yeah. And she gets involved kind of weirdly enough. One of the prosecutors starts offering witnesses. One of the witnesses was this bank robber. Right. Yep. And she starts offering him her panties and like, <laughs> masturbation yeah. aid and like <laughs> so she really starts to get down in the mud here oh yeah um, she's she listen i mean on one level i give her credit right like 
you fight fire with fire because everyone knew Gotti and these guys were trying to buy jurors. But I mean, shit, for a prosecutor to be offering drugs and ma- and and underwear to masturbate to to inmates is pretty tough. Now, again, he, it really didn't matter, though, because before the trial started, Sam Gravano got to a juror uh-huh. um, and basically called George Pape. Okay, He was uh, connected to the Westies, yeah, which was uh, which was an Irish uh, gang and basically sold his vote for 60 G's. So Gotti knew he was going to beat the rap. Um, and that's 19- why you see so many pictures of Gotti sitting there at trial, just smiling. Like he, he just knew he knew yeah. the outcome. Yeah. And he, and he knew he, he knew he was good to go on March 13th, 1987, John Gotti and his co-defendants are acquitted. Uh, and actually years later, George Pape would uh, be charged and convicted for uh, obstruction of justice. Um, and as Blackjack said, that's where the Teflon Don nickname starts to hit. So this is now three times John Gotti beats the rap on two racketeering cases and that assault charge. Yeah. Many believed he was untouchable. It's it because we talked about this with Giganti, and it's so important to note. And I think most people know this just tangentially. You don't beat the federal government. Like the federal government doesn't go to trial and lose almost ever. This dude beat him three times in like four years. It's virtually impossible to do what he did. Sam Gravano is promoted at that point, And Frank Lacasio is uh, promoted to underboss. Um, at that point, Gotti is continuing to live on uh, top of the world. Uh, he was, uh, he was feeling it. In 1988, uh, John Gotti starts to kind of unravel, though. Um, he starts making capos meet him at the Ravenite Social Club once a week, which I think a lot of people started to wonder, like, why are we doing this? Like, there was literally no reason for it because the Ravenite was really easy to surveil. It was literally right in the middle of, of Manhattan. There was all sorts of uh, ways to bug them. And weirdly enough and dumb enough, on top of the building, a woman named uh, Mrs. Cirilli, she lived on the top of the building. And John would pay her to leave, and they would conduct business in her apartment on top of the Ravenite. Now, that's really where things unravel, because John Gotti and any other mob boss or or high ranking person in that time when you had to talk about business you would go outside and do a walk and talk right mm-hmm. because the, the the can't bug the street the, the tap can't be picked up on the street so they would start conducting business inside and that was kind of where things start to kind of fall out of control keep in mind during this time as well john uh, Gotti jr uh, was initiated into the family in 1988 um, according to fellow mobster Michael DiLonardo, uh, they were both uh, initiated in the same ceremony. Uh, and that's something that really kind of ostracized John Gotti to his wife. Uh, if you know anything about his wife, uh, she had already lost one son uh, in Frank Gotti. Uh, and she belittled John a lot for allowing him to just quickly go into the life. Um, she didn't want that for her son. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a logical thing, you know, for a mother. You know, you've already lost one. You probably don't want to lose this one to this life. But at the end of the day, you know, it's hard to feel a ton of sympathy for Victoria Gotti because she was complicit in this life for a long time and she reaped the benefits of it. So uh, it kind of is what it is. Yeah, I think um, and I think she realized and recognized that. I just think she she wanted it to end there, you know, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, whether it's you know, any mobs, I, I don't think you ever have that thought for your son that you want him to go into the life. But keep in mind, you know, a lot of mobsters' sons went into it. You know, Greg Scarpa's kid went into to, to the mob. I mean, uh, all sorts of different guys did. So, you know, it was just kind of, if you know anything about Gotti Jr., he, it was, he, he, he was obsessive over his father. He would do whatever he did. So uh, on January 23rd, 89, uh, John is, uh, you know, what at this point, he's, 
almost you know 50 years old he's on top of the family he's arrested again outside of the ravenite uh, and charged with uh, ordering the hit on uh, john o'connor john o'connor was a union leader he ran the carpenters and, and joiners of america a union um and he had been shot by i want to say the westies and john was arrested after a wiretap, you could hear a faint wiretap where Gotti basically gives the address of O'Connor and basically tells them to bust him up. And that was caught on wiretap. Gotti's released on a million dollars bail. Okay, so he's out on, on, on bail. But later the next year, 1990, December 11th, the FBI finally has a break in their case. And they arrest at the Ravenite, John Gotti, Sam Gravano, and Frank Locasio, who is the current underboss. In that uh, indictment, Gotti's charged with five murders, five murders. Paul Castellano, Tommy Bellotti, Robert DiBernardo, Louis Melito, and Louis, Louis de Bono. And also a conspiracy to murder a capo in the, the Calvacanti crime family. The Calvacanti crime family is a New Jersey crime family. Basically the Sopranos. That, that was what they were based on, the, the Calvacantis. Now, this is where everything ends for John Gotti because not only did they have wiretaps, they had five wiretaps, Blackjack, just five. And I discussed this Cirilli apartment John Gotti would generally talk on the street, but five different times he talked in Cirilli's apartment. And by that point, they had figured out the Cirilli thing. They would always notice that Cirilli would go out and walk her dog, okay? And, and she'd, she'd be gone for periods of time. They figured out that's where they're doing business. They're talking upstairs. And during those wiretaps, Bruce Cutler who was the attorney to John yeah. Gotti and the guy, Jerry Shargell, they're both the attorneys. Gotti becomes disgusted with Cutler because he charges so much, which is a wild thing to be mad about because yeah. he's been he very successful. Yeah. He literally would get him off of everything. Uh, but John becomes having an issue with Cutler and the judge in the case basically says that, Due to you talking about in-house counsel on wiretaps, they can't, they basically can't be your lawyer. Yeah. I mean, listen, John Gotti was ultimately hung by his own noose, right? I mean, he, he talked and he just talked too much, which is the kiss of death. But if we're being honest from a, from a legal standpoint here, um, he really kind of got screwed at this trial in a lot of ways, right? Like it's virtually unheard of to disqualify defense counsel. Like you have a constitutional right to counsel of your right. choice. It is almost impossible to disqualify them. Not only did, did they disqualify Cutler, they disqualified Shargell as well. And then at the trial, they disqualified multiple witnesses that Gotti intended to call and they left only his tax attorney to testify in his behalf, which is, I mean, virtually pointless at this point. So it really was a, a very bizarre trial when, when in truth they didn't need it. They had his own words and they had Gravano. Yeah. And this also creates these tapes, they, an issue develops a crack between Gotti and Gravano because in the tapes, Gotti, along with Lacasio in private conversations, mm -hmm. are discussing that all these murders were basically Gravano's own doing. He was yeah. sick and tired of DiBernardo and Melito and the Bono, and he's the one that killed them. Gotti had nothing to do with ordering anything, which it's not that hard to believe. I mean, for anyone... Like Gravano was a greedy fuck. I mean, he had tons of businesses. These guys were all directly involved with Gravano's business interests. And, you know, he started becoming a cowboy and basically killing everybody. Um, but God, Gravano becomes disillusioned with the mob. 
uh, doesn't think he can win this case um, without Gerald Chargell. And on nine, on November 13th, 1991, after basically a year in prison and no real prospects of winning a case, Sam Gravano flips and becomes a an informant. In 1992, the case begins. Yeah. And they start playing the tapes, discussing the Gambino family business and the murders that were approved and the hit on um, Castellano and all that stuff. And also, an eyewitness of the hit identifies John Carnegie as one of the men who shot Bilotti, uh, then yep. brought Cavana to testify on March 2nd. So all this stuff kind of started to come into place. Um, look, Gotti was done. Okay, that was that. Once they pulled the lawyer, they got Gravana to flip. It was kind of over, right? Gotti became... I mean, it's, yeah, it's, well, once Gravano flipped, it's over, right? Like, at that point, everyone in the family knows it's over. Everyone knows it's over, right? Like, if, if Gravano didn't flip, I don't know, maybe you hold out some hope. You can buy a jury. You can get to someone, although... The feds were probably very keenly aware of this as they did dismiss a juror during this trial. Um, but once once Gravano flips, it's game over. And and listen, we can talk about the merits of that. I mean, I, John Gotti was no angel. And I know it sounds during this that we romanticize a lot of him. And, and I'll grant that. Like, I think he's a fascinating character. But like, Sammy Gravano was a worse guy. Like, I don't think there's any argument. Sammy no, Gravano was a worse guy. Like, he confessed to 19 murders. 19. Including a, a kid. Like, he killed a 17-year-old like, kid. Can you imagine, like, like Ted Bundy going in and saying, hey, yeah, I did all these murders, but I know who the Green River Killer is, so let me walk. Yeah, that's, Like, that that's, doesn't happen. But that's the issue with the federal system, and that, that's something we could talk about for days, uh, the, the, this informant system. Yeah, it's pathetic. Uh Keep in mind, during the trial, John Gotti becomes very hostile, calls Gravano a junkie uh, on True. the stand, uh, is told to almost leave the courtroom at one point. Um, he also equated the dismissal of a juror to the fixing of the 1919 World Series, which, uh, by the way, was committed by Arnold Rothstein, who was a mob <laughs> That's juror. right. That's uh, right. By the way, uh, for anyone That's who right. didn't know. Uh, on April 2nd, 1992, um, after 14 hours of deliberation, uh, the jury found John Gotti guilty on all charges of the indictment. Uh, Frank Lacasse was also found guilty as well. Uh, and the director of the New York City FBI at that point uh, made this comment in a press conference after the uh, verdict. He said, the Teflon Don is gone. The Don is covered with Velcro and all the charges stuck um, later that, uh, that year in June of 92, uh, judge Glasser, uh, sentenced, uh, Frank Lacasio and John Gotti, both, uh, to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole and a big time fine. Uh, at that point, John Gotti is, uh, dismissed to the, uh, USP Marion, which is one of the most, uh, at the time was the highest with the, the most maximum security prison in the country. Right. The ADX was not around. So, right. A lot of people don't know, and, and you know this, Blackjack, there are very different levels of the federal system. So at the bottom, you would have your uh, camps. So that would mm -hmm. be like uh, Allenwood. Yeah. Uh, F F uh, FPC Miami. Uh, there's there's all sorts. They're, they're basically uh, dorms, basically. Yep. They have That's fucking right. cinnamon buns at breakfast yeah. and tennis courts, gardens you know. and shit. It, it's basically, you know, they have one up in Otisville in New York. It's where uh, Michael Cohen goes and Paul Manafort and all these guys. Uh, and then they have like your mid levels and your highs. And then they have your super maxes, basically, which would be Marion, Terre Haute, uh, uh, F, uh, ADX Florence. Like yeah. they're the worst of the worst. And that's where John Gotti went. Basically, 23 hours and one. So basically you're 23 hours in solitary and you can leave one hour out of the day. Now, while in prison, this is kind of a random story. John Gotti is beaten up by a guy, Walter Johnson, who is a member of the blood street gang. Um, and according to people that are in the know, 
Gotti attempts to personally kill this Johnson, but he's put in the hole. So John, John Gotti goes to the AB, the Aryan Brotherhood, and offers them money to kill Walter Johnson. The problem was a few days later, those players that accepted the hit, they were found dead in their cell. Um, and there were some other hits John Gotti kind of tried from prison, but um, that was kind of the end for him. Um, in, uh, in 1998, John was uh, diagnosed with throat cancer and sent to the uh, UM, uh, United States Medical Center for yep. Federal Prisoners in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, has some surgeries. And quickly, at the end of his life, he meets his son. The uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons decides to allow Junior Gotti to go visit his father. And that was actually recorded. It's kind of fascinating. It's a great recording. Yeah. And John basically goes to see his father and asks him because he had been under his own indictments um, on whether he should could leave the mob. And Gotti Sr. basically, no, I, I, we don't leave anything. This is life for us. And he couldn't get through to the kid or to, to his father, basically. Um, by that point in 2002, he had rapidly declined uh, and died uh, June 10th, 2002, at the age of 61. One source close to the uh, to, close to the death said that if you look on his death certificate, he choked on his own vomit and blood. He paid for his sins. Um, so there you go. Uh, and John Gotti was also on record as saying that he'll fight to the day he dies because every day he's in prison, he can stick it to the government one day more. Um, <laughs> The Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, which is its own ridiculous group, uh, they announced that they would not allow a burial of John Gotti, mm. which is really pathetic, frankly. Yeah, interesting, um, considering no one in the Roman Catholic Church has ever done anything wrong. No, I know. And that's kind of the whole hypocrisy of the Catholic Church. And I think one of the things that if, you know, I believe in God, I, I, I read the Bible, I pray, I have my own relationship, but, you know, I... I don't look at the Catholic church the same way. I was at a funeral the other day and, and I was really kind of desensitized to the thought of the Catholic church. But um, again, who are they to judge? Right. Isn't that the point of religion? Forgiveness. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that, that's always been my knock. Uh, if you actually follow the Pope, the current Pope, um, he, he has this big thing about the mob. He, he, he wants to stamp out the mob um, and he won't allow them to associate with the church and, it's just kind of crazy because it's like, well, what about all your people, right? Yep. Uh, Gotti Schreiner was held in a non-church facility. Uh, 300 people paid uh, respects to John. Um, if, if you've ever seen the funeral, it was, I think, the entire Howard Beach and Ozone Park was at the funeral. Yeah. Um, and uh, they gave him a nice send-off. Uh, he's interred in a crypt next to his son, Frank Gotti. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, that's that. John Gotti, a fascinating life. And I think all in all, I think John will take it and say, you know what? I did 10 years. I made a ton of money. My family, I mean, if you, if you know anything about his family, I mean, if you've ever seen John Jr.'s home, I mean, it doesn't look like he struggles much. No. Victoria, I mean, we know all about her. I mean, by the way, growing up, Gotti was one of the great shows when I was a kid. Uh, if you've ever seen it, um, I think I think all these guys, whether it was Vince Giganti or John Gotti, they all kind of, in a way, set their family up long term. Now, I think the issue that the Gotti legacy has always been is that the government was stuck on three different times, and to this day, the name Gotti brings a different sort of punishment. Yep. Um, I know John Gotti's grandson, John Gotti the uh, third, I believe Peter's son, uh, was arrested five years ago or so for some drug dealing stuff, and he got like eight years. I mean, a crazy sentence. Yeah. Uh, and I think you pay because when you stick it to the government one too many they times, don't forget they don't forget. Okay, and to this day, I think John Gotti's family lives okay, but. They also get jammed up on everything. And I think if John Gotti, John Gotti Jr. crosses the street the wrong way, 
he's going to get arrested. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fair to say. I mean, I think, you know, an interesting thing about this topic is it's probably one of our more comprehensive episodes that we'll do just because of who he is, the impact he's had on pop culture, just the impact he's had on, on the mafia. Right. I mean, John Gotti was a romanticized figure and listen, make no mistakes. I understand he led a life of crime. He wasn't the greatest human being walking the earth. I understand that, but he's still a fascinating guy and I can still respect him for a few things, right? Like I respect the defiance in the face of authority. Like I do. I respect that. I also respect the fact that when John Gotti said he was Cosa Nostra until he died, that's the truth. Like he, oh, yeah. He wanted to run that family from Marion. Like that was what his plan was. Yeah. You know, cool. he, cool. he, he was, you know, we've talked about guys on this show who did not have that sort of, of strength of commitment. You know, when it became convenient for them to change their mind, they did. He didn't do that. So I, I respect that on some level. I can also understand that he wasn't the greatest guy, but I also think on a larger standpoint, he's probably the single biggest factor in the downturn that the Italian American mafia has seen over the last 30 years. Before we go, um, uh, an interesting story. Uh, Joe Coffey, who is a, uh, he was a detective, longtime cop in, in uh, the NYPD. He told a story one time about when they arrested Gotti uh, outside the Ravenite. <laughs> Uh, in the case that yeah. we put him away, uh, gave mods. Yeah, he would. He arrested him and was walking him to the car and putting him in the car. And Gotti goes, "I gave you three to one. I beat this." And Coffee just <laughs> laughed and he didn't end up beating it. Listen, you you know that you know how confident he was because go back and look at the mug shot from that day. He's oh, it's dressed funny, yeah. beautifully with a giant smile on his face. Yeah, I, I still, every time I see it, I get a kick out of the one yeah, where he's me too. he's walking down with the yellow, like, uh, he has, like, the tie thing on, and he's well, he's got a huge smile on his face. He he didn't give a fuck, man. He didn't no. care. He, I think when you're at that point, you don't care about going to jail. You're like, you know what? Like, it is Part what it deal. is. Um, one other quick story. I, I always go to this one because this kind of – not that you ever want to humanize John Gotti, but I do believe John Gotti was a fascinating dude. If you look at the mob, I don't think mm -hmm. there's any correlation you can't make with crime. And I think neighborhoods are safer. I, I will say that. I, if you look at Howard Beach, Queens, you think when John Gotti was in control, you think there no was no one's any robbing a house? No. You know, the mob uh, did have their good things. But Gotti Jr. told this story about Gotti. They were at a they were at some kind of party one time and uh, Gotti Jr. was very tough with his wife. He didn't let his wife do anything. She couldn't talk to men like she was very he was very old school. And they were out at this party and John Sr. says to his son, you know, why don't you go out and dance at your wife? And and, and Gotti Jr. goes, well, I don't want to see my wife dancing at a nightclub like I just don't want that happening. And he goes. John, he goes, let me tell you something. He goes, at the end of the day, when all this is over, all we're going to have is memories. And you got to make as many as you can. And, True story. You know, I think that's kind of the whole legend of Gotti. Like, I, you could say what you want about things that he did do. And, and did his big mouth bring the Borgata down? Probably. But I think John yeah. Gotti took what he wanted and ruled for a pretty long time with an iron fist. And ultimately, uh, did he ruin the mob? Maybe. Was he an icon? Yes. You know what it is, Jeff? And I think you really just kind of crystallized it for me with that story. Is there's so many people that go through life just day to day doing what they have to do. And, yeah, you know, you try to just get by. I think the thing that that drew people to John Gotti is yeah we know that we know the things he did right we know that it's not good we know that he wasn't a great person because of the, of the the sins he committed but he lived life and he lived it on his terms which is something that I think very few of us get to do but we all want right we all want to be able to say I to, to quote Sinatra I did it my way he did like for he sure. lived it his way for sure I mean, he uh, he definitely, uh, you know, by the end of it, he uh, 
he, he was whittled down to nothing. But uh, a fascinating uh, character, a fascinating icon, as you said. Um, you know, basically, like I said, from a from a tenement to to, to of thirteen children to Time Magazine, and probably the biggest icon in the history of the Bob. I mean, you ask yeah. anyone nowadays, they know who John Gotti is. So uh, that's that. John Gotti, probably the biggest show we'll do on a on a figure. Agreed. Um, and Jeff, before we go, we have to tell people, please. It's probably both of our favorite movies about about anyone yes, in the mafia. Yes. The HBO movie called Gotti. Do not confuse it with the John Travolta abortion. No, no. It's an HBO movie. It's available free on YouTube. Just search Gotti movie HBO. You'll find it. One of the I'm not going to say one of it's the best mob movie I've ever seen. I've said it before as well. I think it's the best mob movie I've seen. I, I, and Armand DeSante becomes John yeah. Gotti. When you watch that movie and you Google John Gotti afterwards and click on images, you'll be hard pressed to ask yourself, is that is that actually John Gotti or is it Armand DeSante? Yeah, I, I think one one person that I'd love to talk to kind of in final of, of Gotti, uh, John Roberts. Uh, he was a ABC reporter. Uh, he always had a really good relationship with yep. uh with Gotti, I'd always love to to talk to him about uh, kind of. I think it was John John Rob. What, I forget the guy. It's John name. Roberts. You got it. You got his name. Was that his name? Yeah, yeah it's John Roberts. I would. I, is he still alive? Oh yeah, John Roberts still around. Yeah, I would love to talk to him about his uh, about his his conversation. Like he always seemed to have a good rapport with with uh, with Gotti. So, all right, that's that for us. The sit down, great show this week. Really good one. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, next week, we will get into another mob topic. Um, you know, we're just going to fire through, man. I keep going and Let's hope people are enjoying the show. Hope people are enjoying what we're doing, uh, getting a lot of good conversation about it. So uh, make sure you go check out our sponsor, Stable Duel. Uh, if you're looking mm -hmm. for some horse. I know John Gotti would have used Stable Duel. He, a thousand uh, percent. He loved the horses. Um, uh, he was a terrible gambler, by the way, from what I understand. But uh, <laughs> all right, that's that. Great stuff, Blackjack. Thanks, as always. Um, we will talk to you guys again next week here on The Sit Down. Have a great week. Bye-bye.